Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to cardiology lectures. I am Dr. Nick Nickham. Today we are going to talk about uh, coagulation cascade and the mechanism of action of anticoagulants. So, let us begin. The coagulation cascade involves 13 factors from 1 to 13 with the exception of uh, factor 6 which is considered to be same as factor 5 or 5A. And here are the names of uh, all these 13 factors. Factor 1 is fibrinogen, factor 2 is uh, prothrombin, factor 3 is tissue factor, factor 4 represents calcium ions, factor 5 is uh, proaxillarin, factor 6 is missing, factor 7 is the proconvertin. This tissue factor and proconvertin act through the extrinsic pathway. Factor 12 which is uh, Hegman factor, factor 11 which is plasma thromboplastin antecedent, factor 9 plasma thromboplastin component and factor 8 which is uh, anti hemophilic factor. Factor 10 is uh, steward factor and of course, factor 5 is proaxillarin. You may be wondering how in the world can you really make any sense out of this chart with 13 factors and how does the coagulation cascade proceed whenever there is injury to a blood vessel either inside the body or outside the body. First, let us look at the colors. The green color represents the common pathway. The purple color represents the intrinsic pathway and the red or the maroon represents the extrinsic pathway and the factors that are involved. It becomes very easy to understand once we proceed to the next slide. Before we proceed with the coagulation cascade, whenever there is injury to an arterial wall or capillary wall, there is damage to the endothelium. This traumatized segment is filled by platelets creating a plug. This is the immediate response. There is also vasoconstriction along the same lines. This sets off the coagulation cascade. Let us look at the coagulation cascade and the pathways by which uh, a blood clot is formed to plug this leak. Now, we have rearranged all these uh, 13 factors which are involved in the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathway of coagulation cascade. The main purpose of coagulation cascade is to convert the prothrombin into thrombin which is brought about by factor 10 which is a common denominator for both the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathways. This factor 10 along with the cofactor which is phi, it converts prothrombin into thrombin which is factor 2 and this thrombin acts on fibrinogen and converts it into fibrin. This fibrin mesh network uh, traps the red blood cells, the platelets and the white cells to form a rich thick clot. The purpose of factor 13 is to create cross link bondages between these fiber networks to create a hard clot. Another interesting point is that thrombin is one of the most thrombogenic uh, substances in the body. Thrombin not only acts on the fibrinogen and converts it into fibrin, it also activates again factor 8 here, factor 13 and factor 5A. So, this is the common pathway of coagulation cascade for both intrinsic and extrinsic pathways. Now, let us talk about the intrinsic pathway which is uh, depicted here in the purple color. The intrinsic pathway is activated whenever there is trauma to the arterial lining inside the body. Whenever there is a disruption of the endothelium that sets off the formation of the platelet plug we talked about, then it sets off the intrinsic pathway. It starts off with the factor 12 
which is converted which acts upon factor 11 and converts it into factor 11 a and factor 11 a and 12 a are all active factors compared to the the inactive forms. This active form of a factor 11 acts on factor 9 converts and converts it into factor 9 a. Factor 9 a acts on factor 8 along with calcium ions and it acts on factor 10 and it converts the factor 10 into 10 a. This 10 a along with calcium and the cofactor becomes uh, activated which acts on the prothrombin. On the extrinsic pathway which is a short pathway there is a tissue thromboplastin which is factor 3 which acts on factor 7 and converts it into factor 7 a. Factor 7 a acts on factor 10 and converts it into factor 10 a which goes through the common pathway thus forming the fibrin network uh, which forms the mesh for the development of a blood clot. The intrinsic pathway is also involving multiple steps that is why it is a longer pathway compared to the extrinsic pathway which uh, has very simple steps. The efficiency of the intrinsic pathway is determined by measuring the PTT or the partial thromboplastin time whereas the extrinsic pathway which is the shorter one is measured by the prothrombin time. Keeping this in mind now let us look at how a fibrin network is formed. As you can see here is a high electron microscope picture showing the fibrin network with cross uh, bonds in which there are trapped red blood cells. We may also see platelets and white blood cells which forms uh, a soft clot and with the fibrin uh, cross network it becomes a hard clot. And again these colors depict the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathway along with the common pathway of coagulation cascade. Now, here is an example of how factor 13 which acts on the fibrin network and it creates these cross bonds thus creating the cross network in the fibrin mesh which makes the clot much firmer and stronger. Now, let us talk about anticoagulants and their mechanism of action. First of all warfarin or coumadin. coumadin acts on multiple sites namely factor 7 which is the tissue factor that is involved in the extrinsic pathway. Then it also acts on factor 10 a which is the common pathway warfarin also acts on thrombin. So, it is important to remember that warfarin acts at multiple sites the factor 7 which is tissue factor, factor 10 a which is the common pathway it also acts on thrombin whereas unfractionated heparin acts also on thrombin and factor 10 a. The newer anticoagulants that are particularly used in patients with the atrial fibrillation which include Xerolta or Rivaroxaban, Eliquis or Paxaban they work primarily on factor 10 a whereas uh, Debigatron or Pradexa it acts as a anti thrombin agent. These are the mechanisms of actions of uh, various anticoagulants we use in an acute situation when we use heparin or low molecular weight heparin and warfarin on a long term basis for patients uh, with uh, blood clots or Xerolta, Paxaban and Pradexa which are primarily used in patients with uh, atrial fibrillation and sometimes uh, for patients with uh, deep venous thrombosis. Now, let us look at uh, the other types of anticoagulants namely ergotroban and bivaloridin. Bivaloridin is uh, angiomax which is uh, commonly used in the cardiac catheterization lab during uh, coronary interventions. Uh, they primarily act on 
thrombin. These are anti-thrombin agents. There are two active sites on the thrombin, namely the substrate recognition site and then catalytic site. The ergotroban blocks the catalytic site, whereas by valeridin or angiomax blocks both the substrate recognition site and the catalytic site. Next, we are going to move on to tissue plasminogen activators or fibrinolytic agents, the most common of which is the TPA that we usually use in patients uh, uh, with the STEMI who cannot undergo coronary intervention within the first 90 minutes after the onset of symptoms. So, this is how tissue plasminogen activator acts. The tissue plasminogen activator it activates the plasminogen which uh, is converted into plasmin which breaks down this fibrin network that is why they are called fibrinolytic agents that is breaking down the clot and re-establishing the circulation. So, to summarize here is a table showing all the anticoagulant drugs that we use on a daily basis in cardiovascular patients. First, let us talk about anticoagulants. The direct thrombin inhibitors include dabigatran, ergotroban and liperudin. We talked about these drugs already. Then we have the indirect thrombin inhibitors namely heparin and low molecular weight heparin. The vitamin K epoxide reductase inhibitors or the warfarin which acts on multiple sites as we saw in the coagulation cascade. Then the direct 10 A inhibitors that we use commonly in practice include rivaroxaban and paxaban. Now, let us move on to antiplatelet drugs. Our aspirin works through the COX inhibitors whereas glycoprotein 2 B 3 A inhibitors or apsaxamab, eptafabatide and tyrofaban. And then we have the ADAP inhibitor which is uh, clopidogrel or plavix. And finally, we have thrombolytic agents or fibrinolytic agents which act as plasminogen activators thus creating plasmin which breaks down the fibrin network. The most commonly used drugs are of course, uh, tenecteplase or recombinant TPA, streptokinase and redoplase. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is a brief uh, quick overview of a coagulation cascade and various anticoagulants used in cardiovascular patients and their site and mechanism of actions. Thank you so much for watching this presentation. Uh, please do subscribe to our YouTube channel and we will see you next time. I am Dr. Nick Nickam. Thank you so much for your time.